Uh, welcome to today's discussion. I'm your host, Chitendra. Our today's guest is Douglas Futima. He is a professor emeritus at Stony Brook University. He is a world-renowned expert in evolutionary biology, and his books, like Evolutionary Biology, are introduced in university curriculum around the world. His latest book, How Birds Evolve, published this year, focuses on evolution of birds. With that, I welcome Douglas for today's discussion. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to meet you and, uh, and to, to have this discussion. Um, but I actually have the the book that you just referred to. I can I can show the, the uh, your audience the what it looks like. Exactly, so, it's, it's an so amazing. Is, it just just came out one month ago, and this this is not a technical book, or I don't I think it's not technical. I hope it's not too technical. No, um, nice. That was written for people who like to see birds and and what you know and enjoy looking at nature and sometimes ask some questions you know why what am i seeing and why why is it this way so that so that so it's it's about the the many aspects of the evolutionary biology of birds exactly and we'll definitely talk more about it today uh, today i'm also joined by my friend and a colleague anna papa georgiou like me she is a biochemist and a bird watcher um, so welcome anna yeah hi Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, evolution itself. So evolution started as a theory, and today it's a worldview. And um, it, it'll be really interesting to know how did you decide to work on evolution? Um, well, I, of course, I, I became interested in animals when I was very young, uh, I think even before high school. Um, and in, in high school, I became a bird watcher. And I was also very enthusiastic about reptiles. And, um, and I grew up in New York City uh, where we have actually some very, very good parks where you can see many kinds of birds and even some frogs and, and occasionally a snake. Um, and, uh, and also there is the, uh, what at, at that time was the largest zoo in the United States, the what's called the Bronx Zoo. And I, I spent many, 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 uh, many hours there learning about the, the birds and the, the animals and so forth of, of the world because they had this amazing collection. Um, and I also there uh, came to know some of the people who worked there, including a man with a PhD. He had gotten his PhD at the University of Washington uh, who studied herpetology. He studied um, uh, the taxonomy and evolution of lizards. Um, and, so, um, and so this was my introduction to the, to the world of natural history, and um, and so and so it was clear that when I went to university, I would be studying biology, um, and 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 there uh, at Cornell University, um, I had several professors who made a great you know, impression on me uh, because they studied aspects of evolution and they taught about evolution. Um, one of them was a, a very a very very well known ornithologist. Uh, who studied the formation of species in birds and also their phylogenetic relationships among different uh, different groups of birds. Um, the other was a, the, he was the world expert on the taxonomy of ants, but he was also very interested in the pro processes by which new species are formed. And, um, and so they really inspired me and showed me that um, that studying the animals that I enjoyed just as a, you know, as, as, as an enthusiast, they showed me that studying these animals could be a, 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 an, an entry into science and that there was a great deal that was not known and a great deal to be learned. And I began to think, well, at least I would like to learn everything that everyone else knows. And maybe I can, maybe I can somehow uh, add some little bit of understanding uh, to the uh, to, to the subject of evolution. So, so that was my my experience, and um, and so then in graduate school, um, I, I actually when it of course you have to do research to get a PhD, and um, and it, in my case it was rather peculiar because although I had now a lot of experience um, with uh, various kinds of animals uh, in the wild, studying and you know, looking at them at, at wild populations. Um, nevertheless, I decided that I really needed to do experiments. 
And that means mostly working in the laboratory. And so actually my PhD study was uh, looking at genetic changes in um, laboratory populations of fruit flies, of Drosophila, uh, which was very different from what I had ever you know, been done before. But it gave me an appreciation of the different ways in which people can get insights into various aspects of evolution, whether it's from doing laboratory studies, which now are very often at the level of DNA um, and, <clears throat> and cell biology, um, but it, it can be there, or it can be studying natural populations in, in, in natural environments. Great. Uh, so now, uh, if we think about the origins of modern science in biology, uh, the event that stands out is Charles Darwin's uh, discovery of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, which he published uh, in his book on the origin of species in 1859. So could you somehow introduce us to the main themes of uh, Darwin's theory? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, um, so Darwin, <laughs> Darwin was an amazing man. Um, I've looked, I've read parts of the origin of species, you know, probably 50 times, at least 59 times, maybe, maybe uh, 1,859 <laughs> times, I don't know. And every time I look in that book, I say, this man was amazing. He, his mind never stopped working. He asked questions about everything that he saw. And he also tried to fit everything together that he had ever experienced or knew about, because he knew that everything really has to fit. There has to be consistency um, between different aspects. So, so his, his two major contributions were this. Um, first, the idea that organisms have changed over time and that uh, there is a long history of, of, you know, of organisms becoming different over the course of time. Um, and perhaps different kinds of organisms having evolved from one common ancestor. So the idea that all the different mammals may have come from one original mammal uh, species. And this was not an entirely new idea. Um, and you know, even his, <clears throat> even his grand grandfather was one of the people who had postulated that there had been some kinds of changes in, in species, in, in animal, animal compliance over the course of time. Okay. But Darwin was the first person to really uh, put together all of the evidence for this idea. So this is just the, the idea of the fact of evolution, of evolutionary change over vast periods of time. And Darwin was the first to pull together all kinds of evidence that showed that organisms must change and that different species come from some from a, from a common ancestor. And his evidence came from, from comparative anatomy of different organisms, from studying embryos, you know, showing, for example, in a very early embryo, you don't know if you are looking at a human or a mouse or an alligator because they all look the same and only gradually do they develop the particular characteristics of a mammal versus a, versus a crocodilian. And if it's a mammal, whether it becomes a primate or a rodent or, or a horse. Um, so, um, and he also then uh, had information, of course, from the fossil record, which was not very well known at that time, but he had evidence, some evidence from fossils. Uh, he had evidence from the geographic distribution of organisms. And so he pulled together all of these many lines of evidence um, and said the only, the only possible explanation for all of these different aspects of organismal biology. The only possible explanation is if different organisms have come from common ancestors and then became, you know, sort of like the, diff the different progeny, <laughs> the different offspring of a common ancestral species became a, a variety of different species which become more and more different from one another over the course of time. So that was theory number, his first most, you know, for major aspect is organisms have changed and they come from common ancestors. Then his other question now is what causes the change? How is it that they can possibly change over time? And this was an, his really, really original idea that no one had ever had before. And this was his theory of natural selection. The whole idea, he could see that there were inherited variations within species. Not all humans look alike. Not all, uh, you know, not all the tawny owls in Britain, they don't all look alike, they differ in coloration one from another. Um, and he says, if these different variations 
if 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 one if one of them is more capable of reproducing or more or better able to survive uh, in its environment than the other, then that will produce more offspring like itself, which have this favorable ca characteristic, and that will then ultimately increase and perhaps replace any other variant form of that species. In other words, that would be the process of adaptation by what he called natural selection, which is simply, natural selection is simply the difference in the rate of survival or reproduction of different genetic forms of the same species. And today we would extend, extend that now that we know about genes, because if Dar Darwin did not understand inheritance, no one knew how inheritance happens. Um, at that time, and so, so he, you know, he couldn't talk about genes because we, they, they hadn't, they hadn't been discovered yet, or at least he didn't know about the discovery by Mendel, um, and um, uh, and so today we can talk about different forms of the same gene, different DNA sequences of the same gene, and show that sequences that have different mutations in them may cause some slight differences in the organism, in their physiology, their biochemistry, their behavior, their, their morphology, the color of their skin, the, you know, the thickness of their fur, um, and that these differences sometimes uh, enable one form to be able to survive or reproduce better than the other. And so today we can study uh, uh, natural selection at the level of genes, and even, and you know, probably some of you, you and your colleagues, probably to some extent, study exactly this: how different forms of a protein that that are encoded by different forms of, the, of, a, of a particular gene, how those differences in a protein may function and affect the well-being of an organism and its ability to reproduce. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I can have a small really comment here. Uh, so what is also impressive is that uh, Alfred Russell, Russell ha Wallace had independently conceived the very same idea of natural selection uh, once he was collecting specimens in the Malay archipelago, right? So it's, yeah. That's right. It, it, this, was, this was some years afterward, mm -hmm. um, because, Dar you know, because you know, Darwin had this idea in, I think it was 1838, and he didn't publish The Origin of Species until 20, more than 20 years later. And so, um, and so really no one, except he told a few of his friends what he was thinking, but, um, and he also wrote out a draft of his ideas that he, he put, the, put it away and he told his wife, if, you know, if, I, if anything should happen to me, I want you to give this draft to the other scientists of the day so that they will know what I've been thinking about. But he really kept it just to himself and his few close friends. Um, and so Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a younger man who, uh, who made, and much poorer, Darwin was, you know, he came from a financially very comfortable family. He never really had to work or earn a salary. Um, but Alfred Wallace, Russell Wallace came from a working class family and he basically had to make money. And the way he made money was by traveling the world and collecting specimens of birds and beetles and, and everything that he could sell then to the museums in in London and, and Europe, um, and so he was in the as you say in the the, the Malay archipelago um, when he had this bright idea, which was exactly the idea of natural selection that Darwin had had twenty years earlier. Um, but but they both really deserve credit for you know for being so creative and having this insight. Um, yeah, Wallace went on, Wallace is not quite as famous as Darwin, but he went on to make very important contributions, especially in the area of studying the, the geographic distribution of different groups of organisms and how they may have come to have different, to, to occupy different geographic areas. Right. Um, interestingly, where we are right now, me and Anna, uh, so another scientist who used to work here, John Gregor Mendel, in uh, mm -hmm. in the city of Brno. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes, you are you are in a very historically important place. Yeah, yeah. the the yeah the the monk who discovered genes, he discovered genetics. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it it's a pity, basically, because uh, that Darwin didn't get to know about Mendel's work and vice versa, because then 
probably we would have had neo darwinism already like 100 years back or something that's right. <laughs> and then, yeah they by by 1870 or so yeah yeah mendel's paper was published you know in a very obscure place um and it wasn't really recognized until 1900 I and mean, it was i think you know about 30 years before before it was recognized and and then became the foundation of of all of the study of genetics yeah yeah, and uh, so like, if you can introduce us a little bit about uh, on these two theories, like and the right, right, and then no Darwinism. I'm I'm sorry. What is the question? Um, I mean, like now we have the modern synthesis, right? Like we combine the two theories, and we have the modern. Oh, so, oh, so. If you can right. introduce us to this. Right. Um, right. So so. Um, so as I mentioned, Darwin really did not understand how, how, how inheritance happens. You know, how is it that you resemble your parents? Um, and uh, and this, <clears throat> this was not understood uh, until finally, be, and, be, and, the, and the major idea of the time was that somehow heredity is like a fluid. It's like, you know, um, it, you know, it's like mixing two colors of paint and, you know, and, you know, I have a lighter skin and you have a darker skin. And that means that you have more of a dark fluid that is inherited from parents to offspring. And, uh, and, you know, and then some other people, they have a lighter skin, which is inherited from parents to offspring as, as some kind of a fluid. And if you, if you then have, you know, a, a mating between a light skinned and dark skinned person, you maybe have someone with an intermediate skin color uh, and they think, well, that's just like mixing, you know, dark paint and, and, and white paint and you get some kind of intermediate color. So Mendel, Mendel's enormously important contribution was to show that heredity is not due to any kind of fluid, but to particles. And these particles retain their, their form and identity and action as they pass on from generation to generation to generation, whether they're mixed together with other particles that, that, you know, that are for a different, a different coloration or a different phenotype, different characteristic um, or not. And that became, of course, the profoundly important understanding that, um, that, you know, that what, what he called, what ended up being called genes that they are particles, and what we would now say are what we now understand to be DNA molecules, you know, very, very, very long sequences. Um, and so in the 1930s, it really, so it is, as I said, it really wasn't until the 1900s that, that the science of genetics then began. And there were some people who then immediately thought, we don't need Darwin's idea anymore, because what we have now is the idea that we have different genetic types. And um, and there was uh, the, the you know, and we could see that some of these particles you know the are what were called dominant and others called recessive, and um, and if you know if you do a cross between them you get maybe a ratio of three to one you know of the dominant type and the recessive type, and the idea was well maybe the dominant type would simply take over the population because it would make up a higher proportion in 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 a you know in a, a in a in a cross at the time. Um, so there was a great deal of misunderstanding, and it required some mathematicians to show that um, that the that the inheritance of these genes was, you know, uh, was complemented and was exactly the missing piece that Darwin did not have in his theory, which is to understand how favorable variations that enhance survival, how they could be inherited from generation to generation. And to not be lost by blending with, you know, with, with other genetic types. In other words, they would retain their identity. And so showing that Mendelian genes were really the critically important foundation for how Darwin's theory of natural selection could work. This, this is what happened in the 1930s. And that really ushered in a whole new phase of evolutionary study, of evolutionary analysis because it was the big missing piece. So now we had a framework for how, how evolution works in terms of the production of variation in the first place, when the process of mutation of genes was discovered. So you had the production of variation, the inheritance of variation according to Mendelian, to, to, Men, to what Mendel had discovered. And then on top of that, Darwin's you know, showing that some variations could reproduce themselves more frequently 
uh, or would be able more likely to survive than other variations. In other words, natural selection, which would then increase the proportion of the population that had the favorable genetic variation and diminish the fraction of the population of, of a species that has the unfavorable genetic con constitution. And so this union, this union of Darwin's ideas and Wallace's um, with Mendelian genetics, with the modern understanding of genetics, this became known as the evolutionary synthesis or the modern synthesis. And that was the foundation for the, the for basically since the 1930s then, um, that is the foundation on which essentially all of modern evolutionary biology, uh, or the, modern, the modern study of evolutionary processes, of how evolution happens, that becomes the foundation of how our studying of how evolution happens. Yeah, um, this is fascinating. So if we, if we uh, once we are talking about evolutionary biology, of course, and you know, basically, which is the history of life, uh, there are two crucial e events. First event is, uh, you know, transforming from chemistry to biology, to, to life, for example, emerging bacteria, and then um, transforming from uh, prokaryotes to eukaryotes, so eukaryogenesis, right? And then it's also, um, and then now if we see that a tree of life is something which is sort of a Bible for all the evolutionary biologists, right? So can you please also introduce um, us to a tree of life and eukaryogenesis? Okay, um, so you want the entire, you know, four billion like years of evolution. In well, the, the, the brief, the brief <laughs> introduction for the name. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, let me first say that as to the origin of life itself from non-living chemical materials, I am not a chemist. I don't, uh, you know, you could teach me, all the chemistry I ever learned, I forgot. You know, you could teach me as if I was a freshman uh, in, in your university, a freshman student. Um, so, I, so I can't talk about that, we, you know. What I can say is that there are, you know, there are several very important steps in the early evolution of life. And of course, the first thing you recognize is that we had, you know, um, or certainly the earliest, organisms of, of the type that we can recognize today were one-celled organisms that were bacteria and another group called the archaea, um, which in some sense are very simple. They're one-celled and they don't have a, nu a nucleus and so forth, you have many aspects of their, of, their, um, uh, of their biology. And in particular, they have a, all of their genes are, you are on a circular chromosome instead of having a nucleus with, you know, with linear rod-shaped chromosomes like, like we have. Um, at some point, um, you know, quite billions of years ago, it appears as if a, an archaean, which is one of these great groups of one-celled organisms, and a bacterium somehow formed a symbiosis, a living together and with the bacterium living inside the cell, the other, the other cell. And that and those and that was a very you know for presumably biochemical reasons that I don't I know nothing about maybe you maybe you can tell me maybe you can enlighten us um, that combination that symbiosis that living together what we call a mutualism between the two of them was for some reason very successful um, and those so those were the first organisms that we could would call eukaryotes. And the bacterium evolved into the mitochondria that we have in, I guess, every cell of our body has mitochondria, which are the energy producing factories in our cells. Um, and, um, and so these, these early eukaryotes were very successful. And there exist today, of course, in the world, thousands and thousands and thousands of species of one-celled one eukaryotes that have this structure of the mitochondria, which is like the, 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 the descendant of the bacterium living inside the larger cell, okay? And there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of species of those, most of which, many of which have not been described. They are single-celled algae, they are diatoms, they are the, the kinds of parasitic organisms that, that cause malaria. Um, there are many, 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 many of these. 
But in addition to that, again, fairly early in the evolution of life, again and again, I think something like 10 or 15 different times, um, what would ha happen is that the cells, when they rep reproduce and be, you, know, you get two cells out of one, what, what happens when bacteria or archaea do that is, or these single-celled organisms like, you know, like, like, like paramecium and, and, uh, and, and single-celled algae, ordinarily the two cells that are formed from a, from a parent cell separate and they become separate one-celled organisms and then they divide again to give rise to separate one-celled organisms. But what has happened in the history of life is organisms in which the, the, the cells did not separate from one another, but simply grow into a multicellular unit with many cells, um, all from one original cell. And this, this marks, for example, the, the, the origin of the very earliest animals. It happened independently in the origin of the very first things that we think of as plants, which were actually green algae from which later plants later evolved. It happened in the evolution of the fungi. It happened many, at, I think at least 10, 10, 10 or 15 different times. Okay. Um, and so you get the, the evolution then of multicellular organisms with a body made up of many cells which are organized and in which, and this is critically important, and in which different cells, even though they come from, from you know, one, one, one you know, cell that comes from the formation, you know, from, from the union of, of, of like a sperm and an egg, nevertheless, those cells then take on different forms and roles and, and expre express different genes so that they are different, playing different roles, <clears throat> roles in the body. So this then be, you know, is the, you know, the, the, the evolution of multicellular organisms, which then have a process of development whereby the various cells that come from a fertilized egg take on different characteristics and, you know, and in our case become, you know, made up into different tissues and different organs, organs that make up the complex body. Um, uh, there, are, um, there are various ideas, of course, of what would, what would be the advantage of becoming multicellular instead of some, you know, simply unicellular. And, you know, and of course, one advantage is that a large, larger organism isn't as easily swallowed by, by another, you know, as a single-celled organism has trouble swallowing a multi-celled organism that is larger. So you can imagine various kinds of advantages that would come to the very, very earliest organisms that, um, that instead of separating into single-celled offspring, stayed together to find, to form a multi-celled unit. Yeah, interesting. Um, now, now, so so that, that that's some of the processes that have that have happened, and of course, as I said, that ha that's happened you know innumerable times, um, and then within each of those branches, of course, you get then the diversification of different kinds of green algae, different kinds of red algae, different kinds of plants, different kinds of, of animals. Okay, um, and today. And, and of course, one of the one of the things that people wanted to know from the start is Darwin gives us this idea of a tree in which different organisms come from you know from a single ancestor, and in the Origin of Species, he actually he says I am convinced that all the animals in the world, you know whether we're talking about fishes and mammals and insects and worms of all kinds, he says I am convinced that they must have come from one original animal species. Which is a staggering thought, you know. Like, you know, there, you know, there, there, there are probably a million species of insects, you know, at least a million species of insects, probably several million. To say nothing of the rest of them, all those animals from one original form of life. And he goes so far as to say that he speculates. He says, if I carry this logic to its extreme, it is possible that all the forms of life that live today and have ever lived in the course of time perhaps all came from one original ancestral form of life, which is a staggering thought. Can you imagine that? I mean, that, I mean, I mean how daring a thought that was. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, and of course, and basically, and, you know, what we know today is he was right. 
You know, how do we account for the fact that all these different organisms have DNA and it's the same genetic code? You have a, as you, you can tell me more, more than I know about this, but as far as we know, it is largely rather random as to which tip, triplet of, of base pairs codes for one amino acid or another, another amino acid. And it's the same whether you're talking about, about, you know, my genes or the genes of the bacteria that live in my intestine, you know, that we have the same genetic code that is, you know, for, for, for making proteins, whether you're a bacterium or a human being or a plant. Um, and, and so this is one of many, many lines of evidence that, you know, that Darwin was right, that, you know, that, and so if it is the case that all living organisms come from one original organismal form of life, then that means that this idea that you have one, one ancestor that has branched out over time to give rise to all these different lineages and each of them dividing into many different lineages um, so that you have a great proliferation of different species of insects and different species of mollusks and of vertebrates and of plants and of algae and of fungi and all of these different things that they form one vast tree of life, one, one genealogy you know, or family tree of all the organisms that exist today and have ever existed in the past. What a staggering thought. And so one of the major tasks that, people, that evolutionary biologists set themselves a long time ago was to ask, can we, can we really work out that who's related to whom? What is the actual history of relationships? Who, you know, uh, you know, which, which, which mammals are most closely related to humans? You know, which other insects are most closely related to butterflies? Are they most closely related to caddisflies or to beetles or to, or to, to bees or whatever? And, um, and, so, and, and so there's been the challenge then of uh, how do we figure out how, which species are related to whom and which, which have relatively recent common ancestors, so they're closely related, and which of them have more remote common ancestors and are more distantly related. And today, we are in a position that my teachers, back when I was a college student, that my teachers then were grasping toward, trying to work their way toward where we are today when we have the tools to do that. And the tools we have to do that are the ability to sequence entire genomes and compare the genes of across the entire, the entire set of organisms in the world. And using, the, using sort of variations on the basic theme that, you know, if two organisms have really similar DNA sequences, then they probably came from a very recent common ancestor. And if those, same, if those genes are more different in their DNA sequence, um, then they probably have a more distant, more, re, you know, farther back in time common ancestor. Um, and um, the action now, <laughs> that is, that is an, a, a vast oversimplification of what you have to actually do to extract the relationships among different organisms based on their DNA sequences, okay? It is not there are, all kind, there are all kinds of stumbling blocks, okay, and ways in which evolution can mislead us, um, but uh, that, that we, you know, we're beginning to understand pretty well. Nevertheless, we're able to do that. And so we can say now, I mentioned, I mentioned the ornithologist who was one of the people who inspired me as a student. He was one of the first people to actually start using DNA. He didn't have DNA sequencing. This was before it was possible to DNA, use to sequence DNA. But he used another method for grow very, very, very approximately saying whether this DNA is more, from this species is more similar to the DNA from that species versus another one. And he was one of the first, Charles Sibley was his name. He was one of the first to propose that humans are more closely related to chimpanzees than they are to orangutans. Because before that was thought all the apes form one group and humans are this other group and never the twain shall meet, you know. And, and Sibley said, no, 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 here are orangutans and here are chimpanzees and gorillas and right in the middle of them are humans, okay. And that was a, that was a, 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 a <laughs> you know, a, a blasphemy almost in those days. Um, but, um, but he was right, you know, to now, now, we, now we know, yeah, our closest relatives are, are not all the other primates, but, but specifically chimpanzees and bonobos. Yeah.
Yeah, very nicely explained. And actually, that's that's what also shows that, of course, once you get genetics from the from the chemistry, evolution is good enough to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Um, but of course, I mean, there are some steps or there are some events which happen and we don't know very well yet, but still, mm -hmm. you know, work in progress. Yeah. And, you know, and so, some things we will never know because there, you, look, you, from the fossil record, we know that organisms existed, which you would never imagine unless we actually had the fossils. You know, you would never imagine pterodactyls and gigantic dinosaurs if we didn't have, have the fossils to say that, the, that these things existed in the past. And in the same way, you know, there, you know, that, that in the same way, there must be, you know, events that happened at the level of the genes and at the level of biochemistry that transpired in the past, but the, you know, but which don't leave fossils and which we'll probably never really know about, you know, exactly all the steps that happened in the genetic transformations that, that, that underwent from going from single-celled organisms to multi-celled organisms. Some of those changes, we may never be able to, to recover just what those steps were, you know, because they, they are lost in time and, 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 they, and they didn't get fossilized, you know, they didn't get pres preserved. And, and so what is really interesting is that uh, today, like in, now in 2021, with all these advancements, for example, in DNA sequence technologies, uh, we have, I think, like roughly 50,000 uh, bacterial genomes at the species level, uh, 2,000 archaeal genomes and more than 8,000 eukaryotic genomes. And like this, I mean, you know, allow us somehow to really um, follow uh, the, the evolution and like, I think, today more confident, confidently than, ne than ever, uh, we, we know how the evolutionary theory works. Uh, so yeah, it was great, like all this that you described. Uh, but now, like the, my question is like today, 160 years roughly after the origins of species was published, with the knowledge we have accumulated, what would you say uh, is the definition of evolution? How does evolution occur or what drives evolution? Because what <laughs> my intention in your textbook was this phrase which you highlight like that natural selection is not synonymous to evolution. Okay, well, um, forgive me, but I, I thought you might ask what, <clears throat> how do I define evolution? And so I, Looked, I, looked, I, I felt I, I, it's complicated, so I had to look it up in my textbook. What is the definition of evolution? Um, and, and so this is what I wrote. I mean, it's, in a, it's too many words, but um, um, evolution. In a broad sense, the origin of entities possessing different states of one or more characteristics and changes in the proportion of those over time. The biological evolution is a change over time in the proportion of individual organisms that differ genetically in one or more characteristics. So that's, in other words, evolution is simply change, okay? How the change happens is, a, a never, is another question. So one question, what is evolution? Second question, how does evolution happen, okay? And, and remember going, going what I said earlier about the origin of species, that Darwin had, you know, really two, you know, two major, major theses. One is that evolution has happened. And then the other was his, his, his postulate of how it happened, namely natural selection. Okay. So, um, and so that is, that, that is the case today, that, um, that evolution happens. Okay, we, you know, no question about that. Does it all happen just by natural selection? And the answer to that is no, okay. Darwin was absolutely right. Natural selection does occur. It is very important. Many, many, many characteristics of organisms are evolved because of natural selection. You know, we have a grasping hand because you did that evolved in, in our primate ancestors, you know, and Darwin would say it was because any, any genetic changes, what we would now call mutations, um, in certain aspects of the anatomy of the hand that made it able to grasp instead of simply walk, 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 you know, like, like that, um, that those, those mutations would have been of advantage to any kind of organism that lives in trees, you know, and, and of course our primate ancestors lived in trees. Um, and so, and so we, we would account for the shape of the hand and the opposable thumb as a consequence of 
genetic mutations that enabled, that produced the possibility of a, of a, of a digit that was somewhat opposable, okay, to begin with. And those mutations then providing an advantage to the individual organisms that had them and were better able to grasp tree branches and to climb and to get fruit and to escape enemies that way. Okay. So that would be, you know, that would be in some cases, genes that, create, that, that affect a trait in such a way that it enhances survival of the, the or or, and reproduction of those individuals, okay? But there are plenty of changes that we now know about, especially now that we know about DNA sequences. There are plenty of changes that did not happen by natural selection, okay? And so, as you know, um, there are a lot of, of synonymous mutations. So these, these are mutations in particular DNA you know, sites that change the DNA, but don't change the protein that that DNA encodes, okay? And so these are, these are called synonymous mutations. And basically they're neither good nor bad because they don't change the protein. And unless you change the protein, that it has no effect on the organism. You know? um, so you could have a hemoglobin gene as long as it makes the, has the right ser series of amino acids that make up the hemoglobin protein, it functions right. But some of those amino acids might be encoded different by slight, you know, just single base pair differences between my hemoglobin gene and yours. Okay, but it, but it wouldn't make any difference. So, um, so those synonymous mutations have indeed become characteristic of different species. And, we, and they're often particularly useful for figuring out which species are more closely related to, than, than others. These synonymous mutations happen by another process, not natural selection, or the, the, the changes, the fact that different species will end up with different synonymous mutations um, is a consequence not of natural selection, but of another process um, that, be, that, that was worked out by mathematical theory in the 1930s. Okay, so as, as we said, when, when Mendel's ideas of genes got together with Darwin's ideas of evolution, then you had people working out, well, exactly how, how would evolution then work at the level, you know, at the genetic level? Um, and you had some very, very bright mathematicians who worked out mathematical theory of how this would happen. And one of the ways in which they said you know, that you could get evolutionary change is by pure chance. Now, what is that? Chance is, is, is a word that has many, it's mis easily misunderstood, but essentially means that they, you know, that's simply a matter of probability as to whether you get one outcome or another. You know, when you, um, you know, when, when, when you toss a coin, it's a matter of chance as to whether or not it's going to come up heads or tails, right? And so there's, there's, no, there's no purpose to getting a head rather than a tail. So, um, okay, so what can happen is then, suppose, suppose a mutation happens in, in, in my cells that give rise to my sperm cells. Okay, so I have a new mutation, okay. If I don't reproduce, then that mutation never gets passed on and doesn't have any chance to increase in the population. And that, so in other words, it's not because a mutation was bad, it was just because, well, by chance, it didn't get passed on to any offspring, okay? And likewise, you could have an, an offspring with a mutation, which is really terrific. It really enhances your, 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 your stamina, you know, if you have to run away and escape an enemy, if you're talking about, let's say, a mouse or a squirrel. Um, but if an individual with that mutation just happens to get run over by a car, then that's the end of that mutation. Just, you know, it was, you know, it, it had a lot of potential, but, but chance, but by chance it was lost, okay? Um, and so chance events like that can influence whether a particular mutation increases and becomes a greater proportion of a species population, replacing the old form of the gene and the old, the old form of the characteristic that that gene affects, okay? So, um, so chance can influence whether or not these potentially beneficial mutations would increase. But also it means that some mutations that don't really alter the characteristic at all, like synonymous mutations that don't change the protein and they don't change anything about the anatomy or the physiology of the, of the plant or the animal, those mutations have a chance of increasing in the population if the individuals that carry them just happen to be lucky 
you know, that they happen to be lucky enough to survive a little bit more frequently, or they happen to be lucky enough to get a bunch of mates and have more offspring. And so this is a, a, a process of pure luck by which, um, uh, by which um, different, muta different mutational forms of the same gene may increase or decrease. And so you could get one form of that gene increasing by chance in one species, but another species from the same ancestor could undergo by chance the fixation, what we call the fixation, or the you know the the increase and in, in of, of 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 another form of that gene, and so you would have a different difference between those species that has nothing to do with natural selection, doesn't affect the organisms at all. It's just there. <laughs> it's just different, and we now know because because we can look at DNA sequences, we now know that there are many 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 such you know such what the, as I say synonymous changes that don't affect the organism at all. So this is one of the ways in which evolution can happen without natural selection. And so that's what I mean when I say that natural selection is not the same as evolution. Not all evolution happens by virtue of natural selection. Um, and, um, and conversely, you can have natural selection happening, but no evolution happening. Okay. And so um, one of the earliest um, studies of natural selection, that I talk about it in my bird book, um, was in 1899, when uh, along the coast of Massachusetts, there was a very severe winter storm. And, um, and a man named Herman Bumpus uh, picked up, or maybe his assistants picked up a lot of house sparrows, many of which were distressed. Basically, they were sort of flopping around on the, on the, on the streets, um, having been really suffered from this storm. And he, he brought them in and basically overnight, a bunch of them recovered nicely, and, a bunch, and many of them died. And Bumpus said, well, let's just measure the ones that died compared to the ones that, that, that survived. And what he, what he says he found is that the individuals that survived were more likely to be those that were sort of average, you know, in terms of the length of their legs and the length of their wings. Individuals that tend to de deviate, that were unusually small or unusually large, apparently more more likely to die. And he says, well, this looks like what Darwin called natural selection, but it's natural selection that wouldn't change the sparrow population to become larger or smaller. It's natural selection that would maintain the status quo. Okay? Because being either larger than average or smaller than average apparently was a disadvantage in the context of this, you know, this stress. Um, and so there would be a case in which you can have natural, natural selection happening but no evolutionary change. Natural selection is operating, but maintaining the status quo. Yeah, I think this is evolutionary biology 101. If someone <laughs> is starting today, they like he or she can uh, listen to this part of the explanation and just be a student somewhere. Okay, uh, I think that um, one interesting thing that you mentioned in your book, um, how birds evolve is whether chickens are closer to dinosaurs. So is it really- I'm sorry, like, <laughs> close, what, do you, what do you mean closer, closer like the, than what? Like the, I mean, whether, whether they, so if, if you think that the, or if I think that chickens and dinosaurs had a common ancestor, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit difficult to take, right? I mean- <laughs> <laughs> So it is. So, well, um, they, uh, 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 yeah, no, I, the, the uh, there's a wonderful magazine that many of your many people will know called the New Yorker, and um, and they have wonderful cartoons. Um, and one of the cartoons they it shows the hall of the American Museum of Natural History with this gigantic dinosaur skeleton, and there are two pigeons because there are pigeons all over fly all through New York all the time, and there are two pigeons on the floor looking up at it, and one says to the other. Um, I really have trouble seeing the resemblance, you know, the family resemblance. Um, uh, it was, it was um, a, uh, well, the, 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 the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs or that they are, if effectively birds are highly modified dinosaurs, actually goes back to the 1880s. Okay. Because in the 1870s, um, this fossil was discovered in Germany uh, called Archaeopteryx. 
and it's called it's you know it's considered to be the first bird fossil. Um, it's from the Jurassic period. It's not a you can't use uh, around somewhere around 180 million years ago, and it's this this magnificent fossil all laid out in which you can see all the bones. And you can see that it had feathers. It had it had wing feathers, and also had a long tail with long with feathers coming off each side, which is very different from modern birds that have just a very very short tailbone, um, but with long feathers coming off on, off that tailbone. Okay, but uh, arche archaeopteryx had you know just a long tail, you know, like a lizard um, with feathers on both sides, and um, and Thomas Henry Huxley who was a very prominent science biologist of the day and was one of Darwin's great advocates and defenders. Thomas Henry Huxley, you know, examined this specimen and he remarked that it really, that the, the skeleton really looked like that of a dinosaur, a very small dinosaur, but nevertheless, all the, you know, all the, all the, all the bones being, 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 being basically, the, you know, being right for, for a dinosaur. And, um, to find somewhere, um, uh, and um, and well, here for example, I don't know if you can see here. Um, yes. This is from the book. Here's a very famous uh, picture. Here is the hand. Uh, well, maybe sure I get these right. Okay. Yes. Here's here is the hand of Archaeopteryx. Okay. It had a wing with long feathers like a modern bird, but 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 uh, but. You know, but here, you know, here's the wing of a here's the wing of a modern bird, okay, which is very reduced, and you can see that you have the finger bones are are just fused together. You look at Archaeopteryx, and there are separate finger bones, each of them made of several, you know, several uh, 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 bones or, or or phalanges with long claw at the tip of each. Modern bird doesn't have any claw at the tips of its fingers, but here this Archaeopteryx has these long claws, and here. In the 1970s, um, uh, John Ostrom at Yale University um, studied a new, a new dinosaur, newly, newly found dinosaur that he called Deinonychus, and here's the hand of Deinonychus. And it's almost identical in many, many details to the hand of Archaeopteryx. Um, so, so, so Huxley, back in the 1870s, had already suggested that birds could, may, might very well be dinosaurs, and then in the 1970s, Ostrom, uh, John Ostrom, with this Deinonychus, really revived that idea. Um, and he said, you know, and he really developed it and said, look, you know, in many aspects of the skeleton, you really can't tell these earliest birds like you know, Archaeopteryx from, uh, from, from, from dinosaurs. And after that, you know, um, so and and, the, and they're not just not just the hand, but the leg bones and other, you know, a number of aspects of the skeleton. And after that, they started discovering more and more fossils, especially in China, of unknown dinosaurs. And lo and behold, finding all these small dinosaur types in which their skeleton was basically that of a dinosaur, but they had feathers. Okay. Now, a feather is one of the most complex structures. I mean, it really is. And the idea that something that complex would evolve independently like you know, in totally different, you know, different origin in birds from from the feathers that were being seen in dinosaurs, is really unlikely. So you had all of these points of intense similarity um, that really led the you led to this this almost unanimous agreement that birds, yeah, birds are dinosaurs. <laughs> They're just highly modified. Okay, and since then there have been things like there's this little there's a little dinosaur. You know, it's only it's it's only about like that size or so. Um, and I've seen, I've seen this, the, the skeleton, they had it on display at the New York Museum of Natural History uh, called Microraptor. It was a, it was a small four-winged dinosaur. It had long, what seemed to be flight feathers, not just on the hands, but also on the feet, you know, on the, on the hind legs. Um, so it was apparently could, could fly, more or less fly, um, but with four wings, not two. Um, so you had this immense variety of different forms of life, some of them more bird, some of them more bird-like than others, um, especially in, in you know into the Cretaceous before the great big extinction that everyone know, knows about because of the asteroid, um, and um, uh, and so 
the vast majority of paleontologists and ornithologists who work in this area of the, the anatomy and the origin of birds, um, the vast majority of them agree that birds are dinosaurs. There is a very small minority. I know, as far as I know, there are only about three, <laughs> three or four ornithologists who don't accept this. Um, and I should say that one of them reviewed my book in science um, last month, and um, my reaction was um, <laughs> they, they could have found many, many other reviewers who wouldn't, who wouldn't, and he basically, he basically harps on, on this, this, you know, he sort of says, no, 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 Futum is all gone, he's, he's just buying this, buying this orthodox line, you know, that, that about dinosaurs, and, and he then goes on and on about why, why, why that's wrong, but um, but he is very, very much in the minority. And I think he's, you know, a, uh, so anyway, that, that's that. So, um, so this is, you know, but this, of course, is one of many transformations that we know of in the history of evolution. That you know, that are really staggering when you think about them. Um, so whales, I mean, think of a baleen whale. Think of a blue whale. You know, it is the largest animal that is, we know of that's ever existed on Earth. It's got this enormous mouth. Okay? And instead of using teeth, it has sheets of baleen, this like the hair-like substance that it uses for filtering very small crustaceans that it eats things that big. You know, the largest animal in the world is feeding by straining out from the water, filtering out from the water, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of little crustaceans that big in, in, in every gulp. You know, where did that come from? You know, well, I mean, it, there is now universal agreement that whales are related to artiodactyl mammals, to hoofed mammals, you know, like cows and antelopes and sheep, okay, and pigs. They're really, they, they are, they spring from within them. And there are a variety of fossils that show some of the intermediate stages in the evolution of whales from these land living um, uh, um, uh, things that, that, you know, that, that evolved into, into modern uh, cattle and, and, and pigs. Um, but you know, that's a transformation which is just as staggering, maybe even more so than the evolution of birds from dinosaurs. So, so um, so yeah, some, some really very, very impressive changes have happened in evolution. And thanks both to paleontology and to DNA sequencing. I mean, we can't, we can't, we don't know, you can't get enough DNA from dinosaurs to say much about them. But in the case of whales, you know, we can show from the DNA, yeah, whales are, they, they're not just mammals, they are specifically related to cows and pigs. Well, I think I, I just have a small comment here that the It'll be good to mention that evolution, it doesn't invent something new, you know, it just builds on what it already has. And this is one one of the example with the with the whales, right? Well, to, yes, it depends on what you mean by new. You know, the, uh, the, the you know, the, the baleen, the hair-like structures that the blue whale uses for filtering, you know, you could say maybe they're new, but yeah. You know. um, they're new and they're not, but, you know, they use the same proteins, the keratin proteins, that you know that our fingernails are made of in our hair, but um, but they're organized and, and and of course they're being produced in a very different part of the body, they're being produced in the mouth. It's like growing, like having a lot of hair grow down from the roof of your mouth. You know? Yeah, I, I think I, I didn't check the um, elaborated um, evolutionary history of whales, but they say that the, the their ancestor was uh, uh, or they used to be land mammals, right? Yeah, and no, they, yeah, yeah, yes. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. So if one of them, they use the similar kind of uh, structure, then of course, it'll be evident that they also have this, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's great that like birds are basically avian dinosaurs and they have evolved so much and we have a lot of species and both like Zitender and I, we do wildlife photography and, and we are really very happy every time we go out and we find new species, you know, new species of bird to photograph. Um, uh, and okay, so question of individual somehow species, you have give us, given us different examples. Um, but uh, what happens, like if you can tell us a little bit about what happens if we have two species co-evolving, for example, like such as like host 
parasite interactions or predator prey interaction. I think a few years back we couldn't even question about this kind of interactions, but now there are like some model hypotheses like Red Queen or the Cold Jester hypothesis that we can somehow address this question. So if you can like introduce us to these models and like let us know what is your opinion. <laughs> Um, so this is, you're asking about a very, very large field of, of, of research in, in, that goes in many di di directions. And, um, and I should say that my own research, I, I would not say that I have studied coevolution, but I have studied ways in which uh, insects adapt to eat different plants um, and some aspects of that evolution. And I've had students who have been interested in how plants evolve to defend themselves against being attacked by insects. Um, and so this is one area. So that's like predator and prey, where the, the insect is the predator and the plant is the prey. Um, and there, and of course, also there are, you know, antagonistic interactions like this, if we think about parasites, and the plants or animals that they parasitize. Um, so in all those cases, these are, the, those are antagonistic relationships. Um, and uh, the um, and the and the usual models um, involve, of course, that it will be advantageous for the prey or the host um, to evolve to somehow or another to be defended against being attacked or to be against being infected. Maybe evolve to run away faster or evolve to hide and not be discovered by the predator. Um, or in the case of many butterfly, many insects, um, they have evolved uh, toxic chemicals, uh, which will basically make them distasteful so that the predators learn not to eat them. Uh, we have, like, for example, the monarch butterfly is a very well-known butterfly in the United States. Uh, it is bright orange with black uh, coloration that is called warning coloration. And this butterfly is um, distasteful, it doesn't taste good to birds, uh, because when it is a caterpillar, it is, it is eating milkweed plants, it eats only milkweed plants, which have in them uh, chemicals called cardi cardiac glycosides that are toxic, except the butterfly is resistant to the toxin, um, but they are toxic, and uh, predator, most predators uh, will not attack monarch butterflies after they try them once and they realize that it is just distasteful and it's feeling, you know, they're tasting this toxic material and, um, and they will then usually not attack monarch butterflies after that. Um, there are some exceptions. There's at least one species of bird that does attack them and is resistant to the, to the, to the, the poison. Um, and so, um, and so there are many examples um, in which, uh, the, in which the prey or the hosts have evolved various kinds of defenses. Um, um, now vertebrates, for example, have the immune system, which is the most elaborate, complicated defense system that has ever evolved, I think, in any organism um, to fight off various kinds of parasites. So many of them we call pathogenic uh, organisms, microorganisms. Um, and, um, and of course, at the same time, then within the population of the predator or the parasite, then, then there is natural selection for any mutations which enable them to attack the prey, even though the prey doesn't taste good, or even though the prey, or even, even though the host is, is, uh, is well defended. Um, and, uh, and I don't know the, the evolutionary models very well, uh, except the, that it's like anything can happen depending on really just what kind of genetic variation is, is available to enable the predator or the prey to evolve faster and to stay ahead in the race. So um, in some cases, almost certainly, the prey will, you know, loses the race and just, you know, cannot evolve a sufficient defense. And probably there are many, many, many cases of species that have become extinct uh, because they could not defend themselves against, against pathogenic diseases um, or you know, parasites or, or predators. Um, but there are certainly other cases in which it looks as if um, um, there is, if you like, some, some, some degree of coexistence only because the 
predators can't really attack all the prey. They're not they, because they, they, they can't always be successful. Um, the, um, now there are other kinds of coevolution. There are other kinds of ecological relationships among species as well. Um, another kind of antagonistic relationship is when you have different species that are feeding on the same kind of food or are using, or plants, for example, that are growing in the same space, the same kind of soil, and they compete with one another. And, <clears throat> and we all know that it's possible sometimes for one species to be a better competitor and to eliminate the other species. Um, so it may well be that, you know, that uh, some people have a garden and they're trying to grow particular flowers and we, you know, and various other plants start growing there, which they consider to be weeds, and the weeds may take over and present, prevent the flowers from, from, from growing, right? So this, that's competition between species. And there's, um, and there's a lot of, <clears throat> again, a lot of theory about the conditions under which um, there may be some cases in which one of the species is really able to evolve an ability to compete very successfully and eliminate its competing species, its competing species. In other cases though, you have two species in which uh, some individuals are, you know, both species are feeding on the same kind of food, but if some individuals have, them, have mutations that enable them to feed on a different food, which the other species doesn't, uh, doesn't feed on, then it has its own special source of energy and, you know, to be, maintain, it, maintain itself um, without, you know, with, with, without, without competition. And so individuals with, the, with those genes that enable them to feed on a different kind of food will then have an advantage in surviving and reproducing. And so th that species population then will evolve toward feeding on that, that private source of food, if you like, that part you know, that, the input that, the, that the other species do doesn't feed on. And so the result of this process can be that two species, perhaps from the same ancestor, that are very similar with, to one another at first and feed on the same kinds of foods that they will evolve to be different because those individuals in each species that don't compete with the other one have a source of food that they can call their own so that they can prosper. And this process has actually been documented um, quite a number of times. Um, the most uh, famous examples are the finches, so-called Darwin's finches, in the Galapagos Islands that have been studied by Peter Grant and Rosemary Grant for more than 35 years. Uh, and they have, actually, they have actually seen this process happen when one finch species, well, you may know the story that there are several related species of finches that feed on seeds and they have different sized beaks. And those with a larger beak can feed more successfully on large seeds. And the one with a smaller uh, uh, beak can feed on seeds of other kinds of plants that have smaller seeds. Um, and, they, and, the, and the grants saw one case in which a species of finch invaded from another island and the resident species was then faced with a new competitor and it evolved a difference away to, so that it was feeding on a different kind of plant and, you know, and avoiding the competition with the, the newly arrived uh, species that, that, that um, that, uh, that was suppressing its population. So this is one form of coevolution that can lead to diversity. It can lead the a number of species that may come from one common ancestor. And perhaps at first they all have the same characteristics. They're all feeding on the same on seeds and so forth. But this process of competition results in a coevolution, a coevolutionary reaction against one another so that they become more different from one another. And this is something that can give rise then to the diversity, the differences among the various species that come from a common ancestor. Um, and, and this is un, almost certainly one of the things that's been very important in, you know, in the, the evolution of, 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 of you know, the extraordinary diversity that, that, that we have. When you, you think of, of, you know, if all birds came from one original form of birds, how is it that we have albatrosses and the, you know, soaring over the ocean and penguins that can't fly and are, you know, and they're swimming for fish and fly catching species, you know, and swallows that are living on, on, on insects, in, you know, in midair and, um, 
Uh, in India, you have sunbirds that are feeding on with long beaks that are feeding on nectar. And as, as you know, both of you, both of you know birds. And you know that when you go out for a day of birding or bird photography, that depending where you are, you might see 40 species, you might see 50 species. There are places in, in the tropics in which you can see 150 species in a day. Um, I have been on on I have been on trips of you know two weeks into some countries in South America where there are, you know, by the end of, of two weeks, we have 700, 800 species of birds have been seen. You know, and when you think that all of these have come from one ancestral species of bird, but they've radiated into all these different groups that feed on almost every imaginable kind of food and are living in almost every habitat that, uh, that you know, that, that, uh, that, uh, that a land animal can live in, um, you, you know, then you have to ask, well, what is it that caused them to become so diverse, so different from one another in their way of life? Um, and this process of avoiding competition by evolving a way of feeding on something that no one else is feeding on at the moment um, is, is a very, very important part of that process of the diversification of life. And I think here uh, also something like if it's an addition here, I think it's like the social life that uh, they acquire. And you really interestingly describe this, for example, in both of your books, but in the second book, like with the birds, you described it nicely in the ninth uh, chapter, where you highlight the different adaptations, like in social life that birds have, and how like this, like the different kind of behaviors, they allow them to thrive, to survive first and then to thrive. Um, so would you be interested in elaborating a little bit on this? Like, for example, you have given there some nice, very interesting examples of gene selection in long tail feeds, or um, this example with the um, delayed benefit uh, in the mannequins, right? So you <laughs> these are really uh, you're, asking, you're, you're asking for for a lot of, of, uh, of let's see what what um, just trying to see if I have any nice pictures to show. Well, here's yeah, here's um here's here's a one. One photo that that is uh, not a very good photo, but maybe I can show it anyway. So, um, so, so there. Um, so one of the, one of the, one of the questions that has um, um, uh, that 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 really Darwin had to confront early on was he said, you know, natural selection. He thought of natural selection as in part being what he called a struggle for existence. And, um, and one of the things that causes a struggle he recognized was exactly that there'd be competition for food or space or resources of one kind or another. Um, and he recognized that because he realized that every species has the potential to grow in numbers very, very rapidly. You know, you could start with just a few and after a few years, you're going to have hundreds or thousands of them you know, because if every species can, you know, Every individual uh, pair can give rise to many offspring, and so he said the fact that that most species they don't they don't become more abundant year after year after year they don't get more and more common rather something has to be limiting their 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 abundance so it must be that they are limited by some kind of resource the amount of food or something like that and that means that there must be competition among individuals for that for that that scarce that scarce commodity so. And so, you know, and so the idea of competition was inherent in Darwin's ideas of natural selection. That means that when you find examples of cooperation, is that you might not expect to, you might under Darwin's you know, theory of natural selection, that you might not expect to ever see um, individuals cooperating, cooperating with one another. And so you need some kind of variety of special explanations whenever you see cooperation among individuals of a species. Okay. Now, in some cases, it's obvious that there's a benefit to cooperation be between, let's say, male and female. They have to cooperate at least long enough to mate, okay, and, to, you know, and have offspring. But it's obviously to the benefit of each of those because individuals that don't mate don't pass on their genes to the, and so whatever characteristics they have have no future, you know. If they don't have off, if they don't have descendants, 
then what their particular kinds of genes don't 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 get propagated only if you know the but if you have but if you have genes that impel you to attract a mate and then to successfully mate then those genes for whatever characteristic made you attractive will be passed on to next generation so it's the same thing with any kind of cooperation if you see individuals of a species cooperating not just by mating and raising the young together, you know, to be sure that the young survive. If you see species cooperating in any other context, you likewise have to say, they must, if they have that behavior, it probably means that they have genes which are influencing their, their behavior, influencing them to cooperate. What enabled those genes to become, to increase and become carried, when they, those genes started out as rare mutations, just individual genes mutating. What enabled those genes to be carried by more and more individuals so that they now are a characteristic of the entire species? Yeah. And in the case of cooperation, that really seems to be something of a puzzle. You might say, for example, why do birds go in flocks? If, you know, if I'm a starling you know, and I join a flock of a thousand other starlings, it means that whenever I'm trying to get some food, I've got 999 other birds trying to eat the same food that, you know, that, I, that I need. So there's an obvious disadvantage to being in a flock. Okay. So you have to ask, well, what are the possible advantages of being in a flock? If, if there's a disadvantage, there must be some kind of, a, of, a, of an advantage on the other side that outweighs the disadvantage. Um, and, and you say, well, the advantage is if there are predators around, the advantage is really obvious. Because if I am the only individual that is a potential prey, then the predator is gonna come for me. But if I'm in a flock of 100, then maybe the predator gets what get, succeeds in killing one, but my chance of being the unlucky one is only one in 100, okay? Because the chance is probably someone else in the flock is going to be the unlucky one who gets eaten. Um, and so, the, so that becomes a very simple, what looks like cooperative behavior, of everyone getting together in one flock, but the but it's to every individual's advantage to be in the flock, basically because there's safety in numbers. You know that someone else is likely to be the one who actually gets get, you know, gets gets to be unlucky. Now there are other kinds of cooperation that are more more complicated, and and uh, so Jitender I think re referred to the mannequins. So here's the story. These are you know, brightly colored. The males of these the little tropical birds. They're about that big. In the, in the neotropics, the, Amer the American tropics. And there are quite a few species of them. The males are brightly colored. The females are, um, all the species, it's very, very hard to distinguish the females. They're just little, little green birds like that. But the males are brightly colored and they differ from one species to another. And especially what differs is their courtship behavior. They have elaborate dances that they perform while they're making noises at the same time. You know, really elaborate dances um, and in many of the species, the male forms what are called leks, in which you have a number of different males that are in the same general vicinity. So, if, so a female could come in and compare the behavior of one male and look over, in a, over to a different tree and see another male, and she could sort of shop for the male that she, you know, that, that she would most like. In certain of these mannequins, they not only get together in a loose aggregation, sort of all of them showing off in the same general area, but also you get two males then cooperating to form a jointly perform a courtship dance. Okay. And they are really, they're really quite amazing because you have these two males and they go moving along a branch and then one hops over the other and starts down at the other way. And they keep doing like this, you know, each hopping over the other, for, forming cartwheels and making noises at the same time as they go around and around and along the branch. Um, and what's been shown by several investigators is that, um, that you have to, why do they do this? Because almost always one of those males is the lucky, is, 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 the, is the dominant male. And the chances are, more than 99% that the female will mate with the dominant male. So you have this, a, a, a subdominant partner male who is cooperating with the dominant, but almost never succeeds in mating. Why is he doing that? You see, how do we explain that? That's crazy. Okay. 
Um, and the answer turned out to be, he's just waiting his turn, <laughs> you know, the, because females will not, if he, if he goes off on his own and just does a solitary display, females apparently are not interested at all. They, they really, they, they are attracted to pairs of, pairs of, court, of dancing males. Um, and it's apparently, it's, it's, it's the same apparently in turkeys. Um, so here's, I don't have any photos of the mannequins, um, but here's a photo here of the wild turkey um, that, um, that occurs in, in my part of the world. It occurs around here. And again, although they form loose flocks, when the males are courting, those two males were together, courting together as a pair of males to attract a female. Um, and 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 uh, and the females don't don't really don't like solitary males. So what what's been discovered is basically the the subdominant male has no chance of mating if he just goes off on his own. Mm -hmm. He has almost no chance of mating as long as he's with the alpha male. But eventually the alpha male dies. Okay, and then the subdominant male becomes the dominant, and he will be then joined by some other young male who's just starting out. Okay, and then so basically it's like you know deferred satisfaction. So that's one way in which um, in which being cooperative can 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 pay off. Can you know? Um, but it's obviously a very special case. The more usual explanation was one that was that Darwin hinted at, but he really didn't fully understand, especially because he didn't know about genes. He didn't know about shared genes between brothers and or between relatives. Um, but you ask. Let's step back a moment and ask, why should a parent bird feed its offspring? Like, isn't that an altruistic thing to do? You know, instead of just looking out for her for herself. And you say, well, I mean, it would be crazy for her not to feed her offspring because then they would just die. So what would be the point of having offspring in the first place? And in particular, any genes that that mother has wouldn't be passed on to the next generation. So whatever characteristics she has, would not be transmitted, and they would just sort of die out when she dies, right? So the so if so and but uh, so on the other hand, any mutation which kind of programs the the chances that that a female bird will feed her offspring, that mutation for being a good mother will be inherited by her offspring. If and if they survive, that will will be inherited by still more offspring in the in in the future. Okay, whereas you know, whereas a female that has a mutation that says, just look out for yourself, forget the kids, you know, don't worry about them. Um, that mutation is basically destined to be lost. You know, it's not going to get passed on. So this is the way in which a gene for any kind of behavior, or cooperative behavior would, would, would persist. Now, think about cooperative. So, so the idea here is that in a sense, the female bird is taking care of the genes of, of her own genes, you know, copies of her own genes that are being carried by her offspring, okay? And those offspring are then going to propagate on her own genes after she herself has died. But offspring aren't the only individuals that carry her genes. Um, so does her sister, because they inherited genes from the same parents. Okay. So, by and large, you will tend to have some sharing of genes between related individuals, whether those individuals are your offspring or your brothers and sisters, or even to some extent, your cousins, although the chance that you will have exactly the same genes as your cousins is less than the chance of having exactly the same genes, genes as your brother or sister. Okay. But, um, uh, but nevertheless, the fact is that your, your siblings have a chance of 50% of carrying the same, if you have a particular gene, the chance that your brother or sister also has that gene is 50%, okay. um, which is almost the same as, as your offspring having that, had that gene. And so those two turkeys I just showed you were two male turkeys that will, are more likely to successfully you know, get a mate, um, or to be more exact, one of them will, will get a mate. And the other turkey that is basically part of a coalition to help him get a mate is his brother. Okay. Turns out that the wild turkeys, brothers band together. And because if I help my brother mate, okay, my brother has the same genes that I have, by and large, 
you know, 50% chance of having exactly the given same gene that genes that I have. And so my genes are being passed on indirectly if my brother, if my brother is successful in mating and, and having offspring. So this is the idea of what's called kin selection. Um, and Darwin hinted at it, but it wasn't really developed um, until the 1970s by a, a British uh, a biologist who, um, who was you know, Bill Hamilton, William Hamilton, um, who was really, you know, really a, a genius. He was both a very, very good naturalist. He really knew his birds and insects, and, and, but he was, also, he was also a good mathematician. And he worked out the, the mathematical probability of this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, if a female, uh, a female get this mutation that just take care of yourself, uh, the species dies until unless male get the, the other mutation that take care of your children, um, mm -hmm. then they can fawn around like uh, in Australian uh, fa fairy wrens, right? Where the, the ma males they take care of the, uh, their children. The, yeah, the, let's, we, we, let's not talk about fairy wrens that are too complicated. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand fairy wrens that got really complicated by the life histories. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but, so, of course, we are almost at the end. And I mean, um, and before we let you go, um, there is one interesting point. I mean, nowadays, of course, we are talking about climate change, which is anthropogenic climate change. Um, uh, where we, I mean, th there are people saying that it's not because of the uh, because of the, the men or because of humans in general, um, but it is a fact. I mean, we know from science now, and th there is a, a strong scientific consensus that it is anthropogenic climate change, right? Ab absolutely, there is no question about that. Okay, that we are seeing huge, rapid, rapid climate change, and it is due to human activity, okay? And almost entirely due to the combustion of fossil fuels, okay? To the production of carbon dioxide and methane to some extent. And this is the cause, but so please continue. What? Yes, so, the, so, so your brief comment, how it affects the evolution and biodiversity in general. Yeah, well, it's hard to be brief because it's a very large topic. And it's one in which, you know, of course, unfortunately, we, like almost everything else, we don't really know enough. Uh, we know a fair amount, but we don't know enough. Um, so the, so the, the okay, so the, the first question you have to ask is, are species at risk? And then if they are at risk, you have to ask, what is the chance that in one way or another, they will, never, they will nevertheless survive this risk? So the first question is, are they at risk? And the answer is absolutely that for a whole variety of reasons, that we are almost certainly, we are at the beginning of what a, what a paleontologist would call a mass extinction. So, so you know that in the history of life, there have been several times in which events happened that eliminated a large fraction of the, of the, of the species of, or of, of plants and animals in the world. The most famous of these, which happened 66 million years ago, probably was caused by a collision of an asteroid or some other um, a, a body with the earth that caused an, just an a enormous impact. And the result of that was the extinction of many, 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 many kinds of organisms. Many of the earliest birds are gone, the last of the dinosaurs, although there's plenty of dinosaurs went extinct before that, but the last of the dinosaurs, many groups of insects became extinct, many groups of plants, I mean, and in, the same in the ocean. So there were, uh, so this, this was enormous. Um, um, uh, but anyway, so we are now, we are really now seeing the beginning of another mass extinction of that kind okay? um, that, that, that humans are causing. And it's being caused in many ways. A probably the three major aspects have been, first of all, the destruction of habitat. Okay. If you, you know, if you go through central United States, you will not see any natural habitat at all until unless you go to a special preserve. Um, there are some national wildlife refuges, which I have to give credit to duck hunters because. Those are places that are major breeding grounds for ducks. And the fact that duck hunting is such a big sport 
that is so popular has resulted in the creation of these refuges for, for ducks to breed. And of course, many, many other kinds of plants and animals then can, can breed there as well. But if you get outside these few parks or refuges, you will see essentially no natural vegetation. It's all agricultural land. If you go to any suburban development here on Long Island near New York City, where, where I live, you will see almost no native species of plants. Everything's landscaped with Asian, Asian or other alien plants. And the result of that is that there's nothing there that American insects will eat, will eat because most insects are very, you know, plant feeding insects are very specialized and they won't eat insects, plants that they aren't already adapted to. And that means that insects, which are the foundation of most bird populations, um, that, you know, that it's going to affect birds as well as lizards and everything else. Um, so habitat destruction is an enormous problem. And of course, we know that the biggest impact of that is in tropical forests because tropical forests have so many, many, many more species of birds and everything else, plants, insects, everything. Tropical forests are much, much richer than forests at higher latitudes. And so the deforestation that has happened in Southeast Asia is horrendous. The deforestation that is continuing in Southeast Asia, especially with the spread of, of oil palm, is eliminating tropical forest at a rate that is just horrifying. And we, you know, in, in American newspapers, we are always reading much more about what's happening in Brazil um, and the Amazonian forest, which again, in the last few years, a larger, an amount of tropical forest has been eliminated, cut down in the Amazon, that is as much as the size of our smallest states. Um, so, so this is number one for loss of, loss of biological diversity, including birds. Number two has been the use of chemical pesticides. Um, the, you know, at one time, the, the great culprit was DDT, and that was banned as a result of environmentalists led by Rachel, famous woman, Rachel Carson. But in recent years, we now have, again, an enormous proliferation of all kinds of herbicides, especially that are, that are really creating, creating havoc. And the third cause of this mass extinction is climate change. The fact is that, you know, that it is being documented everywhere just two weeks ago, <clears throat> I spoke at a, at a symposium of the Entomological Society of America, and the subject of this symposium was the worldwide decline of insects. And in some places, the insect decline has been more than 50%, you know, in terms of the total, the total biomass of insects, of flying insects, anyway. And if you lose insects, you're going to lose birds and lizards and spiders and almost everything else, because they're a critical part of the food chain. And of course, on top of that, you, you, ha you have, as a result of climate change, direct impact on bird populations as such, that you know, it exceeds their thermal tolerances. It means a change in the seasons, and that disrupts the breeding of birds because then they won't, the, if, you know, if they don't change their, their time of, of egg laying, um, to match the change in season, it means that they won't be matching the, the time of the greatest seasonal abundance of insects that they need to feed their offspring. So this means you know, reduced, um, <clears throat> reduced as, uh, success, as well as the fact that migratory birds that migrate to the tropics, they don't know whether in New York it's now an early spring or a late spring. And you know, they're, they just, they have, a, they have a genetically programmed migration schedule that will have to change if they're going to match the changing seasons. Okay. And so this then is one, this raises the question to what extent are, what are the ways in which species may be able to survive in the face of these, of these changes? So number one is that local populations don't adapt at all. They simply become extinct. And the species survives only if individuals can colonize other places which now have the, ha the, the climate to which they are adapted. Okay. So in other words, if it is getting warmer, okay, and it's no longer possible to survive and success successfully bre breed in, let's say, Virginia, then it may well be that that climate to which a species is adapted, that climate is now found not in Virginia, but farther north in New York or in Massachusetts. Okay. 
and the species may survive even if it becomes extinct in Virginia, it may survive if it colonizes and forms populations further north, which is where the climate now exists to which it is adapted. This is being seen in the case of many species of birds and other, and other organisms as well, but, but you know, there's more information on birds because people are out there watching them <clears throat> and counting them. This is being seen on mountains where the particular thermal, you know, temperature regime is different at different altitudes, but as the world gets warmer, a particular temperature regime is moving up the mountain so that now to find a certain kind of level of warmth, you have to go higher because, than you would 20 or 30 years ago. And the birds are moving up the mountains along with the temperature regime to which they are adapted. Okay? And of course, the ones at the very top, the alpine species, have no place to go. You know, if it gets too hot at the top, if they do not adapt physiologically, then they're simply going to become extinct because they can't live up in the air. And um, so I, you know, I, I have been, I've been, you know, I've been on mount, I've been on mountains from the from the tropical level up to the up to the very top. You know, the the the, the alpine in South America. Um, in India, I've been to uh, to the the uh, Eagle's Nest. I think it's called it at uh, Arunachal Pradesh. That maybe some of maybe maybe you know, um, and uh, uh, Jitender, and um, and you can see at different different levels in the mountains that there's different vegetation there's, and there are different birds, and those are now moving moving upwards. So that's one possibility for a species to survive is. It's called tracking its niche. The niche moves, you know, and the species may be able to move with it. But in some cases, that's simply not possible. And it's certainly not possible if the species cannot actually move bit by bit. And it may be one thing for an, a bird to be able to fly over a, to the other side of a city, um, but it won't be possible for a lizard or a salamander to be able to migrate through those kinds of of, of regions that are simply you know, inhospitable, where they simply cannot live, they can, cannot travel through them. So that's one possibility is the species, the populations die, but the species lives because it moves. Okay, uh, number two, there is some degree of physiological flexibility and tolerance. Um, so um, you know, we we all know that um, you know if we if we work out physically, we'll be stronger. We'll be able to run faster. Um, uh, we know that if you know if if I go from sea level up to the top of a mountain in the first days, I move, have to move very slowly because I'm out of breath. But after a few days, I'm somewhat acclimated and I can move a little bit faster. So these are ex and and so these are examples of physiological acclimation. And it's possible that many birds will be able to physiologically acclimate to some extent to higher temperatures, but there's, that's very limited. It's very limited to the degree to which they can do that. Um, and also bear in mind that temperature is not the only thing that is changing as we warm the environment. What's really, really, really even more threatening is aridity, is drought. Okay? And we see that in many parts of the world. And in many parts of the world, of course, this, this not only has a huge impact on humans, if you can't grow crops because it's too dry, because there's, no, there's no rainfall, but we already know that this is causing immense damage to bird populations. Okay? And that is not something that birds can adapt to. They simply cannot live without water, period. You know? um, so, so, um, so, you know, so that, so the physiological tolerance is, is um, is, is limited. And then the third is, is it possible that they will be able to adapt by evolutionary change? So that means, evolutionary change means having mutations in the population which are now rare and have not been advantageous in the past, but under the changed conditions do enhance the ability of the, of the individuals to perform, to reproduce, to survive. So, and in that case, natural selection would result in the increase of those mutations that enable individuals to survive under these now very harsh conditions. And the existing traditional genotypes then would decline because they are more susceptible to these harsh conditions. So that would be adaptation by natural selection. 
And I have two points to make on that. One is that the natural selection does not happen unless there are mutations in the population, unless the mutations occur and exist as genetic variation in the population. If there aren't any resistant, you know, rare genotypes, then they won't be able to increase in frequency and be, you know, and contribute to the adaptation of the species or the population as a whole. And um, so we, there we need to know much more than we do. We really don't have enough information on how much genetic variation is there in wild populations of birds and other animals and plants for the ability to tolerate higher temperatures, drier conditions, okay? As well as changes in the optimal time to breed, which is usually governed by the photo period, the, the day length, response to day length. So there are all these, you know, all those features that might have to evolve in order for the, for the species to be able to adapt to these environmental changes. And that's not counting the other changes that the species may have to contend with as a result of climate change. Because at the same time, the climate change is causing changes in other species. So other species may be moving into the region because they are more warm, warm adapted. And suddenly our, the species that we are looking at now has new species to that, that it has to compete with for food. Or maybe there are new kinds of parasites that are coming in, uh, you know, being carried by other species. Maybe there are new kinds of predators coming in. And so there'd be multiple, multiple threats, not just, not just the temperature, but also the drought and the biological, environmental, ecological changes in other species that, that, that a species may have to contend with. So this means that when environments change really rapidly, and this is a very rapid change, as you know. I mean, you, you know, I mean, people will, you know, almost, almost everyone realizes that the weather, the, you know, that, it, that we've had this past year and the year before is not what it was like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Everyone, everyone knows that. This is happening incredibly fast. And the faster an environmental change happens, the less likely it is that species will be able to evolve and adapt to it. We have another source of information, and that is the historical record from, from paleontologists. So over the course of the last million years, we had one of the most unstable, climatically unstable periods in the history of the Earth. So this is the whole Pleistocene period in which we had glacial advances and then it would get warmer and the glaciers would melt back and then it would get colder again and they would come down. Where I live in New York was covered by ice 10,000 years ago. Okay. There was a, a huge ice sheet several kilometers deep where I live right now. In fact, Long Island, which is a, an island that extends to the east of New York City, Long Island was formed by all the rubble that was pushed by the glacier as it came southward, from, you know, the, it just pushed part of the top, the topsoil and the land and everything else, and dumped. And then when it stopped and the glacier melted back, that left a large amount, an amount of, of sand and so forth, which is where, exactly where my house is, where I am at this moment. So, uh, so the point is that we have seen what happens when climates change. Okay. In, you know, in the fossil record. And what happens is that the species don't stay in the same place. Even if this, you know, even if, even as further south, there's no, no ice cover, there's no glacier, but it's colder, right? And then it gets warmer. What happens is that the species don't stay in the same place. They shift, they, they have shifted their ranges. They moved to the south when it got colder and they retreated, they moved back north when it got warmer. And this happened multiple times during the last million years, as you had a succession of glacial episodes and interglacial warmer, warmer, warmer episodes. Um, you know, there, at one time there were walruses in southern United States, along the coast of southern United States. Um, the, uh, the fossil record of beetles in England shows that species which were common there during the colder periods today can be found only in places like Siberia. 
and species during the warmer interglacials when it was really warm in London today can be found only in Southern Europe where it's warmer. And so what is that during these periods, most species were not adapting. They didn't simply sit in one place and adapt to the cold when it got colder and adapt to the warm when it got warmer. Instead, they became extinct there and the species survived only because it colonized areas further to the south when it got colder or further to the north when it got warmer. So if that was happening during the Pleistocene, in which these changes in the climate were occurring over the course of a few thousand years. And if species could not adapt and stay in place during to those changes that were happening, what we would think of as very, very slowly, the chance that they will be able to adapt genetically and you know, evolve adaptations to changes that we are causing that have been a major change just within my lifetime and yours, that means that really evolutionary change is unlikely to be fast enough to save very many species. We're talking about a real tragedy that lies ahead. And this is why, you know, this, I mean, obviously people who are, you know, bird watchers, bird enthusiasts, naturalists, um, you know, biologists you know, like myself, you know, we, you know, we can, you know, we, we can be crying out saying you must do something about climate change. But of course, we're not the only ones, you know, I mean, every, every intelligent person who's, who knows about what's happening in the world says we have to do, we have to solve the problem of climate change. But you see what happens, of course, when you're talking about changing systems that are deeply entrenched, where you have political and social interests and economic, especially economic interests, that are so hard to change. You know, we've seen this past climate change, you know, as a summit in Scotland, which is, I think, the general agreement is that it's a lot of nice talk, but very little evidence of serious action. Um, and so I and so I'm I'm very pessimistic about, about this, the, the, the aspect, the, the, the prospects of adaptation to climate change. And very, I'm very very pessimistic about whether or not there will be any serious, serious amelioration causes of climate change. Yes. On the other hand, on the other hand, I don't want to be a total pessimist because not every species is going to be eliminated by climate change. There are going to be those that are relatively tolerant and certainly, you know, over the course of, you know, the next hundred years, there can be plenty of species which will be able to persist if we allow them to, if you know, if we don't totally eliminate their habitats, if we don't cut down every forest that there is, if you know, if we don't plant everything, you know, with with um, uh, with herbicide resistant crops, and so one of the plays that I make at the end of my book is to say, look, there really are major efforts being made to save to save endangered species, and there are many conservation organizations that you could look up easily and there, you know, many of them are very prominent. There are some that are specifically focused on the conservation of birds. There are others that are more generally conserved about saving habitats just for the benefit of all the different organisms that, that use those, habit, those habitats. And these conservation efforts have been successful in saving a lot of species that were at the brink of extinction. Certainly, the, certainly, there's no way in which we are going to save all the species that are at the at the edge of extinction now. But um, but conservation organizations, especially those that that focus on preserving habitat and encouraging local people to see the value in those habitats, in those forests, in those birds, in those other resources, um, those you know those um, uh, those kind of, those organizations and those efforts. To um, you know, to save habitat, are um, you know, I think are really, really worth 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 pursuing. Here's what here's a photo I have in my book that I want to show you. This is I don't know if I can see very well. This is a painting on the side of a schoolhouse in a small village in Ghana. And this bird right here, the kind of white bird looking bird with black wings and weird yellow on its head, is um, is called the white-necked Picathertes. It's a bird about the size of a crow, and you know it's about so big, whatever. 
And there are only two species in that family and you have to go to Western Africa if you want to see them. Um, they're very strange birds, very bizarre birds, but they, every, 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 every birder who goes traveling around the world, want, who wants to see birds, wants to see these, these rock fowl or pick of thirties. Um, and so I, you know, I was in a group that went to see them and I took that photo because, why? Because these birds are a major source of income for the people in that village, okay? Birding groups that go there want to see the pick authorities and the local local people bring them up to you know at the right time of day and say, okay, now, and they have benches set up and they say, we just sit down and wait and they will come. And indeed the birds do because <laughs> they're on a daily schedule. Um, but the point I'm making is that those people, at least in that village, have learned the value of that forest because it holds that bird, which is a source of income. And so I, you know, so I, I, you know, I say there are many ways in which you can support or encourage the conservation of birds and, you know, biological diversity in general throughout the world. And if we, you know, if we all were to get personally engaged just a little bit, even if it's just a matter of making some, you know, small financial contributions to some of these organizations, even if that's all we can do, then, you know, I'd say do it. You know, do your part for, for, for the salvation of, of nature, of the natural world. Yeah. And one of the um, optimistic message that someone can take from this discussion is, so till the time and another ast asteroid doesn't hit the Earth and we are, <laughs> we are, we are alive and we yeah. want to maintain the same biodiversity, we can, we can think of life in this way that through the course of natural selection, we got this staggering amount of biodiversity on, on Earth. And there is one species which is at least able to question, you know, its own existence and the existence of the other species and life in general, right? And uh, I think that this species which has survived so long, at least like, <laughs> or maybe not so long, but can really come together and bring that change and you know at least do its best to preserve that biodiversity. I hope I hope you're right. <laughs> I just I just I really do. We but you know the um the, you know, we we can all have some influence uh even if it's just talking to our neighbors and encourage your you know in my case you know, I'm thinking I should encourage my neighbors to plant native plants instead of, you know, instead of foreign plants. And maybe that will encourage some butterflies and beetles and birds to, you know, to, to increase in, in this, this area. So we all have ways in which I think we can make a difference. Um, and the more we speak, the more we act, you know, the more we communicate with one another, the more we try to communicate with politicians, um, you know, the, the, the greater the hope will be. So I, there is, there is, there is hope. Yeah. And I have something interesting In, before no, we close the session. Uh, but I think we don't have time for that. Uh, we definitely need another session with you because we have yes. really nice questions and like, but yeah, time has already, pa already passed. So I think we should start closing the session, right? Yeah. So of course, I mean, we, we can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your ideas and uh, your uh, all this knowledge uh, uh, on, on the different topics on evolution and also on climate change. Um, so thank you so much for today's discussion. Uh, we enjoyed a lot. Well, so did I. I. I'm afraid I may have spoken too too much and too long about a few things. I, I, I think there were a few other questions that you may have wanted to cover, but maybe sometime in the future if you want to do that. But, yes. um, but it's, my, it's been my pleasure. So you know, thank you very much for giving me this, this opportunity to express myself. So closing also like this session from my part, I would like to thank you also like that. It's really been an honor that we have you here, especially years after, you know, having been introduced to evolutionary biology through your textbook as an undergraduate, for example, in biology, it's a great honor for me to have you here. I'm grateful that you accepted the invitation. And um, so like the following quote, I think in your words from your textbook, 
that summarizes what evolutionary biology means to me. I mean, it touched, it touched me a lot. And I would like to really to share briefly this. So you say that evolution has neither moral or immoral content and evolutionary biology provides no philosophical basis for aesthetics or ethics. But evolutionary science, like other knowledge, can serve the cause of human dignity by helping us relieve disease and hunger and appreciate both the unity and the diversity of humankind. And it can enhance our appreciation of life in all its magnificent diversity. So thank you very much. For thank you again very much. With us. Bye.